Netherlands Sea, the United States ambassador to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, Piet Hoekstra. When the ambassador was three years old, he moved to the Netherlands, where in his later years, he became the vice president of marketing for Herman Miller, chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, and served as a congressman for 18 years before being sworn in by the current president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. During our discussion, we will attempt to draw upon his expertise as much as we possibly can. We'd like to start by getting to know the ambassador, then transition to the state of emergency, discuss U.S. foreign policy, then the transatlantic alliance, and conclude on U.S. intervention. We hope these topics will draw on his responsibility as the country's representative in order to understand the coherency and red line behind the policies of the country that he represents. Look, we understand that there are a passionate few of you, but we'd like to ask you and plead with you to use our audience questions as opportunities to be heard as opposed to deliberate inter interruption. We know you understand. For now, a warm welcome, the Ambassador of the United States, the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Ambassador, welcome again <laughs> to the Netherlands. Um, so as uh, Elmer mentioned in his speech, after 50 years of living outside of this country, you're back. So are you happy here? Uh, we love it here. Uh, I'm here with my we wife. Love it? Okay. Uh, I'm here with my wife. Uh, we've been here 13 months. Uh, we love the, uh, the people that we, we work with. We enjoy the projects that uh, the State Department has assigned to, di or to, to myself here. Um, and the weather, the weather is fantastic. <laughs> Who would have thought we would have moved to the Netherlands because of the weather? Uh, because of, uh, the weather. But uh, yeah. it's, it's good. No, everything is, is fine. But would you call this country home? No, no. Home is? Home, home is Holland. Holland, Michigan. Ho home is uh, Holland. Uh, Holland, Michigan. Uh, the United States is home, uh, but this is my birth country, so it uh, it has a special place. Uh, you know, it has a special place for for me and my family. Let's talk a little bit about the Netherlands, because when I lived in the United States, some people aren't very aware of the country. It's a small country. How would you describe the Netherlands to people in the United States that aren't very aware of it as a country? Well, I think uh, it was described on one of our TV networks as. No wonder they're good at ice skating because they all skate to work in the winter uh, up the canals in, uh, in Amsterdam and they are known for their windmills and, uh, and those types of things. But from a professional perspective, it's, this is the country that was the first country that officially recognized a, uh, a new startup country uh, in, in North America uh, by firing the salute at St. Eustatius. They helped fund uh, you know, the, our civil war. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been friends uh, ever since. Uh, this is our, lo our longest-lasting relationship. Uh, we've never fired a, a shot at each other in anger. And another way, if I may interrupt, that the Netherlands is well known to the world is for its, say, more progressive values. And from our research, uh, just looking at your voting record when you were congressman for 18 years, uh, doesn't seem that you share those values. Just looking at, for example, civil rights, you banned gay adoptions, uh, drugs, you were in against the le legalization of, of marijuana, against gun control. It just seems to us from our research that you have, when you were in Congress, you voted against, the Nether against America becoming somewhat closer to the Netherlands, at least in this respect. Would you agree? Would no, you agree? no. I, I don't find the Netherlands nearly as progressive as they like to say they are. Where, uh, where I, don't you see that? Um, and, and I evade that the natal unsemensis I haven't felt lung attaining, uh, okay? <laughs> and so if you criticize the Netherlands, it's like, oh, what do you mean? Uh, but uh, no, I, I worked for, uh, you mentioned, I worked for Herman Miller. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a company that in the 70s and the 80s, and still today, but when I worked there in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, was recognized as one of the best places for women to work. But in terms okay. of, for no, no, example... No, 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 but, but no, no, let me finish. Okay. All right? You said you would interrupt, and I said I would finish. <laughs> um, but progressive is, there's a whole range of issues. Mm -hmm. I go talk to Dutch businesses all the time. And I look, when I sit around the table with the management teams of Dutch businesses, 
the Dutch business teams so look like okay. look like me. Yeah, yeah. Okay, they're uh, 40, 50, they're male, white male, and they're yeah. white. I'm sorry, Herman Miller in the 1970s is much was much more progressive and is much more progressive still than what the Dutch are today in terms of integrating women into professional management roles into the private sector. But so don't call America or me not progressive. Uh -huh. There are areas where you may be progressive. There are other areas where we may be progressive. Climate change. I am thrilled, okay, that the Dutch have gotten on the bandwagon of the climate change issue. America, Which bandwagon? What's that? The bandwagon of Donald Trump, or what do you mean? Which ban we, bandwagon? We as a country, we've gotten to the point where America produces between 35 and 40 percent of its electricity from carbon-free processes, whether it's hydro, whether it's nuclear, whether it's wind, whether it's solar. The Dutch are at somewhere between 10 and 13 percent. I would say those are two examples where America appears to be significantly more, if you want to use the term, progressive than the areas that, that you brought up. So there yeah. are areas where maybe the Dutch can say, yep, we are progressive. Yeah. There are other areas where America is forward. So okay. on those areas that I would say the Netherlands is more progressive than your own personal values, have you been here for one year? Have you changed your views on those things at all? No. So for example, abortion, you still uh, are in disagreement with it, uh, gay marriage, uh, legalization of marijuana. I mean, the country still works, right? Which country? This country. Sure. Yeah. So you think that's just some uh, differences that should be respected, or wh what, I, I would hope what conclusion do you draw? I, I would hope that, uh, and I think it's one of the characteristics of the relationship between the Netherlands and America, is we recognize we have lots of things in common, uh, the core values uh, of recognition of human rights, uh, you know, freedom, democracy, markets, and those types of things. that we have so much more in common and in those areas where we disagree that we respect those disagreements. Yep. Uh, you know, uh, that's not unusual. I'd, I'd be very surprised if we found that we were in total agreement on everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we, we respect those areas where the, the Dutch society has moved into a different direction than where the U.S. has moved, and we hope that in those areas where we have moved in a different direction than where the Dutch are, that the Dutch respect our opinions uh, on those issues. But let's talk about the, for instance, you just drew, there's also differences and similarities naturally, but you moved from Holland to go to Holland, Michigan, which is predominantly Dutch roots. It has tulip festivals. It's a very Dutch place to be. But how was it for you to internalize being an American in an area that was really predominantly Dutch in culture and in tradition? Not hard. Not hard? I mean, it, it, sure, we have tulip time, uh, you know, and, and those types. But West Michigan is, take a look at the, there was just a book written about the companies that um, were founded in West Michigan. Herman Miller is mm -hmm. one, recognized globally for its design and its management practices. Um, the, you go through a whole list of companies that have global, that have a global reach. Uh, you know, when you, you talk about the Dutch, uh, you talk about, uh, at least as I've heard it, people talk about the Domine and the Kaufman, okay? And, you know, the Dutch business acumen finds itself very much into, uh, finds its way into West Michigan. People like to portray, people in the Netherlands like to portray West Michigan as this insular little place that is still the Netherlands from 50 years ago. I'm sorry, come and visit. Uh, it is one of the most cyber-connected communities uh, in all of America, and it has globally competitive businesses. It is the Kopman uh, of the state of Michigan. But you uh, don't think your behavior was changed a bit being surrounded by Dutch Americans as opposed to just Americans? But, but you're not surrounded by Dutch Americans. Holland, Michigan, if you come to tulip time, uh, one of the great things is that you will see is on May 5, we do, we do Cinco de Mayo, yeah, yeah. okay? Uh, and when you watch the Tulip Time Parade uh, a week later, you will see that a third of the kids uh, who are walking in Dutch costumes, uh, holding tulips, are Hispanic. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so they're not, uh, okay. Okay. I understand, but let's go back a little bit because your family did eventually move there. What was the reason why your family decided to move from the Netherlands to go to Holland, Michigan? In, in, in 1956, when my parents uh, decided to uh, emigrate, my mom would say that uh, part of it was a sense of adventure, uh, but they would also say that in 1956, the Netherlands was still a tough place. Remember, the Netherlands fought World War II, you then fought a second war. You fought a war uh, in Indonesia. So right after World War II, it wasn't that all of the Dutch resources were going back into rebuilding uh, the Netherlands. You were fighting this other war uh, in Indonesia. So even in 1956, uh, the Netherlands was still rebuilding. And so they said they could, they, they, they could have had a good life here, but they said there was more, there was, they wanted to go to a place where they were relatively assured there was okay. going to be more opportunity for their kids, so they decided to leave. They, they left for the three of us, uh, so my, I, me and my brother and my sister. I, I think it's interesting that you mention a uh, tough place and also uh, uh, going to America out of a sense of opportunity, because we'll we, I would agree that a lot of other refugees, immigrants, asylum seekers coming from Central America or even Mexico, they have those same dreams, yearnings as your family did. Do you have any sort of solidarity or sympathy towards these same immigrants? I mean, America has and continues to be a country that welcomes immigrants. Still, with the current administration? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, but because Donald Trump and the recent Republican Party has supported the RACE Act, which aims to cut immigration, legal immigration, by 50%, then why work for an administration that is clearly against legal immigration? I think you'll find that... Uh, the U.S. will continue to be one of the most welcoming countries uh, for immigrants uh, coming in uh, to, uh, to our country. Really? Yes. But you don't think when they purposely reduce the amount of permanent residency cards it that they do? It hasn't been reduced. I mean, this is a process that is working its way uh, through Congress. Supported course, by the administration. The administration is supporting it. Well, it is a process that is working its way uh, through Congress, and let's see what the actual outcome of that legislation uh, will be or whether it actually even becomes a law. So you would say that today's administration is as welcoming to immigrants in past administrations. So take the Obama administration, for instance. Well, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say it's as committed as this administration or that administration, mm -hmm. uh, but you are not going to see an America that has closed borders. Okay. Um, not even a wall. Well, a wall, there's... What you have with a wall is, I, I love it when, you know, when, when there's a little bit of a laugh through the room because, well, you know, you're building a, a, a wall and you're actually putting in place borders, <coughs> enforceable borders. And, you know, many people are critical of the United States. But you say the administration One of the things you need to recognize is Europe hasn't necessarily been all that hospitable to immigrants as well. As I think, I don't know exactly where the boat is in the Mediterranean, uh, but I think it's a Dutch registry boat uh, that has been trying to take people in from Libya. We need to recognize that migration is an issue that the, and that the United States is wrestling with. It is also an issue that the EU is wrestling with, and this is an area where Maybe the EU and the U.S. could be better off talking about uh, how are we going to handle migration flows, whether it's from Central America and Mexico into the U.S., mm -hmm. as well as migration flows from North Africa into Southern Europe or from the Middle East and Syria uh, trying to come into the eastern borders. Migration because of the attractiveness of our societies in the EU and America make us a destination point. I don't think anybody is talking about, well, there are people who are talking about, let's just welcome everybody in. Uh, I think we're all talking about how do we manage Making a migration flows? How do we manage the people that really are suffering and that are refugees? These are tough issues, and we ought to spend more time talking about how to address these uh, than pointing our fingers at, well, this is what the U.S. is doing. It's kind of like, well, wait a minute. 
This is what's going on with uh, EU. Take a look at right now, and uh, you so have a new hotspot on migration, which is Venezuela, which affects the Netherlands because part of some of the people who are trying to flee Venezuela uh, are going into Curaçao, uh, and right now they may not be getting the most hospitable ref uh, welcome in Curaçao. But in other countries in South America, they are. I'm not sure what. Okay. Uh, but I, uh, regardless, I think just I just want to yeah. make something very clear. Uh, so you do, you would agree that these people that travel across for miles, sacrificing everything, leaving uh, sometimes even family members behind, all their property, whatever it is that they have, those are the exact same people that America wants as future citizens. No, what I said is that we have an immigration process and we have a legal okay. way for people to enter into the country uh, just because someone wants to come into America or just because someone wants to come into the EU and they're willing to leave their roots and their family and their home and to come here does not give them an automatic entry card into either the EU or the US. But we should create a system that facilitates that process. We should, we should create a system that allows us to bring into the country the number or into the EU the number of people we want coming into the into the EU or to the US that we believe will strengthen uh, the EU and the US that we can integrate that we can assimilate okay uh, and those types of things. It has to be a managed process. I think this is a good time now to move to the audience to see okay. if there's any questions. Uh, would Great. anyone like to ask a question? Uh, yeah, so, the gentleman uh, over here with the uh, this, yeah, uh, blue shirt. Could you please stand up, oh, sir? Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Uh, in June 2006, you made a press conference in which you uh, announced that chemical weapons have been found in Iraq. Right. Uh, as most people had at that time found out that this was not true, there were no uh, weapons of mass destruction. And at this time, I think most people would accept that the war in Iraq caused a lot of the instability that is maybe causing a lot of the refugees to come now. Do you accept your role in the massive refugee crisis that's happening at currently? Yeah, if, uh, if Europe's willing to accept its role as well. It was a coalition that went into Iraq and yes, led by America. Your own personal responsibility? Yeah, I, I voted for it, yeah. okay? I mean, I'm a member of Congress. Uh, it's, you're on record, okay? Uh, does Europe accept responsibility for the role that it played in Libya? That was one where America led from behind, and I believe Europe led from the front. Tell me that Libya has been a, an overwhelming success and that it has not contributed to the refugee flows coming uh, as a result of activities in the Middle East. I think one of the things that uh, the EU and the United States uh, and NATO ought to spend, be spending more time talking about is the consequences of our interventions. Yeah. We, they, we never, they haven't necessarily resulted in what we expected was going to happen. Iraq didn't turn out the way that the United States and the coalition expected Iraq to end up. Libya hasn't quite ended up the way that we wanted it to end up. Syria uh, is, is another problem. And so yes, for those policymakers uh, in Europe and in the United States, sure, you accept responsibility for the decisions that you made. Uh, but one of those responsibilities then forces people, should force people to go back and take a look at what the consequences were and how that will guide future decision making. Yeah, we will touch upon intervention and also uh, foreign policy uh, later on in the interview. Any other questions? Uh, so yeah, the gentleman over here. We have room for one more question. Later on, we will uh, have other space. More space. Do you believe that the U.S. holds any responsibility for the refugees that are a result of U.S. foreign policy and intervention? For example, in El Salvador, Honduras in the 1980s, uh, and now Syria and Iraq since 2001. Responsibility in taking them in? No. No. Why not? The, these are complex foreign policy uh, issues. The... Um, 
you know, you can't, does the U.S. and does the world community have a responsibility to refugees uh, and, those, uh, and those individuals? Absolutely. Does it mean that it gives them an automatic ticket into uh, the United States or gives them an automatic ticket into, uh, you know, Western Europe? Uh, no. I so don't what should so. they give them? What's that? So sh what should the U.S. and Europe give these immigrants or these people affected by those same conflicts America and, the, and Europe created? I think what we need to be working on is trying to create stability uh, back into their uh, home country. So number one, many of these people want to go back, create an environment hopefully where they can return home. That may or may not be the case uh, in, in, every, uh, in every situation. I think you know, obviously there are going to be parts of Iraq, uh, there are parts of Syria uh, where it is going to take a tremendous amount of time for, if ever, for the wounds to heal in those countries so that people who at one time were living side by side within the last 10 or 15 years, uh, you know, before that may ever uh, happen again. If you go to Jordan uh, and a couple of other places throughout the Middle East, uh, you will still see uh, big refugee camps of, of Palestinians who were displaced uh, with the creation of the State of Israel, okay? Yeah. I think we'll touch upon U.S. foreign policy a bit later, but I think we yeah. should go back to domestic policy of the okay. United States currently. I think a big reason why so many people are here is because of the state of emergency. Uh, Trump has stated explicitly, I didn't need to do this. If it wasn't even necessary by his own standards, how can we consider it a state of emergency? The, the president is using a, a tool that he is available to him. The president believes it is important for him to uh, secure our southern border uh, for a number of different reasons uh, and has chosen to uh, uh, exercise his power to, to do that. But Ex exercising power has never been done this way before, though. Of course, the tools have been used before, but never before has there been 53 previous declarations had never had congressional approval or support for the funds. This is the first time he's doing it without congressional support for the funds at all. It is a, it is a tool that the president has available for him uh, to manage the security of the United but, States. But you would consider it unprecedented. I have not gone back uh, and taken a look at all 51 or 53 other declarations of um, national emergencies, uh, so I can't. Uh, I can't. I can't, get, I can't give you. Uh, I can't give you uh, an analysis as yeah. to whether it is unprecedented or not. And from the ones you've experienced in Congress, uh, there is uh, the swine flu and 9-11. Don't you think that those were actual crises and maybe the border wall, uh, the need for a border wall is not really a crisis? No, you're not going to get me to say that. 9-11 uh, <laughs> obviously was, uh, you know, was a, uh, a, a, a special event in a tragic way. Yeah. Um, clearly a, uh, a national emergency. You know, I'm not involved in outlining uh, or evaluating the president's and, and this administration's or Congress's actions okay. on on a day-to-day -day basis. I, you know, my job today is to promote U.S. interests and the U.S. agenda in the Netherlands, uh, and so. Uh, when I was a congressman, I, I, had the, I had the latitude and the freedom to speak on just about every issue that I got, uh, that I got questioned on. Uh, as the ambassador, uh, number one, I don't study those issues on a daily basis the way that I did when I was a congressman. Uh, and as an ambassador, I have certain latitude and capability in how I actually address those issues. But no, the, the biggest thing is I'm not studying each and every one of those uh, issues every day. Okay. But we could try and address this issue from at least a little bit of your point of view before because you said that you were the Tea Party movement before the Tea Party, which I know that maybe you don't want to go into the nitty gritty of your personal views, but that is a pretty dramatic comparison to other political parties, uh, especially in regards to fiscal spending. Do you not think that the border wall, the $8 billion that's being allocated towards it, is an example of a president going too far? No. Not at all? No. I mean, you're looking at a country, and I don't know exactly what the, uh, the debt number will be uh, 
uh, or the deficit number will be for 2018, 2019. But it, uh, right now we are in the, uh, the hundreds of billions of uh, dollars on an annual basis uh, in terms of, uh, of our deficit. And the, you know, the bottom line, you, I'm not going to get into the granularity of the president's policies uh, in these areas because number one, I'm not fully versed on it. Uh, and number two, it's not my responsibility to address those issues uh, as the ambassador, okay? To um, address the issues regarding the administration. Because the oh, no, I, address the, I, I will address uh, you know, the, the issues addressing this administration as they relate to our interaction with the Dutch government and our objectives. But don't you think that, I, I mean, may, don't you think that declaring a state of emergency the, in the manner that he did, that maybe that would have an impact within the international community? I mean, someone that bypasses Congress, someone that then gets funds from different departments to do what he declared he was going to do in the election period. Don't you see a potential response from the international community? The international community has the freedom to respond to American domestic policies in whatever way that it wants. Okay. Okay? So you don't fear a potential pushback from the Netherlands, from Europe? If the Dutch government wants to push back because Donald Trump has made a domestic policy decision, that is the full latitude of the Dutch government, and I know how the Dutch government responds when I make suggestions, or if I would even think about making suggestions about domestic, Dutch domestic policy. Uh, uh, and you know, I said, yeah, I, I can't believe you're doing this in that. Okay. They would say, hey, Pete, thank you very much for your opinion, but it's none of your business. Okay. So. It's none of Europe's, Europe's business. It, if they want to make it their business, they can make it their business, okay? I can't control that. If they want to spend their time focused on, you know, well, this is different than, you know, Obama doing this for a national emergency and Trump did it this way. And if they fully, if they believe they understand American politics to that degree and they want to articulate their opinion to, if Dutch, if Dutch government officials want to articulate that opinion to me, they're more than free to, free to do it. I, I don't have a problem. And I, I, I would actually, I would take the input and I would put it in a cable and I would send it back to Washington and say, here's what the Dutch government thinks about uh, you know, uh, this bill that we just passed on, uh, on highway construction. And the State Department may or may not take it and pass it on to, to Congress and to the President and say, hey, the Dutch have some ideas for uh, how we fund highways. Okay. Okay. That's okay. L let's talk about your role as ambassador. I think it, the Trump administration is definitely an unorthodox administration in some regards. I mean, he tweets at three in the morning. We don't know when people are going to get fired particularly. I don't think we need to dispute that. But how do you as an ambassador handle what we could consider generally unpredictable behavior when functioning as the representative of this country? I find that much of the, uh, the stuff that people call unpredictable behavior is actually predictable behavior. Uh, some of the unpredictable... Like well, people said, well, you know, you pulled out of, uh, you pulled out of the Iran agreement. The unpredictable nature of the, of the president on Iran was he said he was going to do it on day one and actually took 15 or 16 months trying to work with the EU to fix the Iran agreement before we actually pulled out. Um, you know, the, uh, I actually find on a lot of this stuff, uh, there's been more predictability to it, whether it's on, on this, whether it's on NATO spending. Uh, you go down the list and it's, you know, this is a president that's actually doing uh, much of what he said uh, he was going to do in the campaign. Okay, so I, I found it interesting that you, at one of the first questions we asked you, you mentioned Europe and Europe's attitude towards Donald Trump. And actually, I have a little graph here that's very interesting. It shows uh, the percentage of people saying from different EU, EU countries that they have some or no confidence for the US president. So you can uh, mm -hmm. look at it there. And when all the lines go down, that's exactly the moment in which Donald Trump wins the election. But regardless, we live in the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, as, as you've mentioned and uh, talked quite a lot about, uh, there's a unique relationship uh, between America and this country. 
what do you think makes this relationship so unique? The things that make the relationship unique are the foundations of it. The things that make it unique are how the long. The foundations? It, the foundation, the values. The I values. mean, uh, I gave a speech at the Machiavelli speech uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, where we talked about you know, some historians will say that our Declaration of Independence uh, takes much of, uh, takes many of its ideas from the, pl the placat that I think was done here in the, was it 1581 or 61? 1581, okay. Um, so uh, the placat, and so the values uh, there. So it is about, it is about values. freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion. I think uh, the king back then said, you know, the, um, he said, you know, the king should not uh, rule over uh, a man's conscience, which really led a lot of people to interpret that as saying, you know, the government should allow for, for freedom of religion. Uh, the king also back then said something along the lines of the rulers should serve his subjects and it's not the other way around that the subject should serve the king. Uh, those are two values that are very much enshrined in the United States. So that's what I'm talking about, uh, a foundation. We, mm -hmm. we, we share a lot of those values and whether the Pacat actually influenced the de de Declaration of Independence or not, there will be others that will, be make, will make that determination, but a lot of them see consistent threads uh, through that. And apart from values, maybe <coughs> business? Well, you, you, you've had a long, enduring relationship. Uh, then you've got the business relationship. We believe in free markets. We believe in free capital and the movement of capital and goods and services. We believe in free trade, um, or we believe in, in open borders and trade. Um, even Trump? Yeah. Yes, even Trump. Open borders let, 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 in, wait, wait, wait. in trade. Okay. Now, that's, that's just my perception. I, sure, I wouldn't say okay. What, what Donald Trump has done on trade is, who pays more tariffs, American goods going into Europe? Uh -huh. Are those tariffs higher or lower than the tariffs of European goods going into the U.S.? Well, it it no, depends no, no. on the product. Well, right. but overall, no, but if you, do a, if you do a weighted average, which one's higher? I think Europe. Europe, yeah, all yeah, right. Definitely. So what Donald Trump has said, I'm for equalizing and lowering all tariffs. Okay. And where's the pushback? The pushback is in Europe. Who's more, of a, who's more of an open trader, Donald Trump or the EU? I'm sorry, the answer and the figures are pretty clear. Donald Trump. Donald Trump offered the EU, what? Zero tariffs, elimination of non-tariff trade barriers, and what was the response from Europe? The response from Europe was, yeah, oh, wait a minute. We, need to, we can't do that because of agriculture. Well, it's part of the agreement. But I want to touch upon one product specifically, which is uh, cars. Cars. Yeah, cars. Let's talk about cars. Because the US Department just released a memo that highlights cars as potential national, national security threats. Right. And I want to understand how are the allies, your allies' products a national security threat? The president is using the tools that are at his disposal to try to get Europe to come to the table and negotiate. But come on, it sounds more like an economic threat than a national security threat. The framing just seems odd. The president is using his tools to get the Europeans to come to the market, to come to the table and negotiate. Why will Europe not negotiate uh, and lower tariffs and open up the European market in the same way that we have opened up the U.S. market to European goods. Okay, well, Why won't you do that? I can't speak for Europe on their behalf, but I do want to talk about negotiations, particularly from the United States. Uh, I think you didn't say that the rhetoric wasn't predictable, but I think we should at least agree that it is somewhat divisive. Uh, as someone that's supposed to be promoting unity and collaboration, does Trump's divisive rhetoric make it difficult to do that? You know, when you confront your friends on legitimate questions, I don't know why, the, the easy way to say is, well, that's just divisive, okay? You know, 
people say, why is the United States not committed to NATO? It's kind of like, well, that's an interesting question. We, we pay significantly more than what all the countries have pledged to NATO. Why is the question not more along the lines of, why are the Dutch no longer committed to NATO? Okay, well, you said a friend's comparison. Trump has called NATO obsolete. Would you consider that a nice way of speaking to your friends? I would say that calling, calling Europe out and saying, in 2014, you said you were going to spend 2% of your GDP on providing security to the people of the Netherlands and to the people of Europe. It is now five years later. You are at 1.2%. You have no plan to get higher than 1.2%. Okay, there is no plan. There's no, there's, I can't look at a plan, and I think the, no, that you were gonna get to this by 2024, 21. There's no plan to get there, all right? So for a United States president to come out and say, why is the, why are, why are the Netherlands, why is the Netherlands not committed to NATO? I think it's a fair question. And, and, and it's kind of like the question then leads to, do you not want to commit to NATO because you view it as being obsolete and no longer addressing the security concerns of, uh, of Europe? But the way you're speaking about it is a lot more diplomatically than the actual president will do. I mean, of course, yeah. it's true. The commitment thing is a topic. But when you take about countries like shithole countries or keep talking about America first, come on, for us, that seems divisive. What am I missing here? You can, we can talk about the president's style. All right, you're uncomfortable with the president's style. Okay, great. If that, if that is the reason you're not going to spend on, if that's the reason you're not going to spend on NATO, uh, if that's the reason you're not going to open up your borders uh, for trade and, and those types of things, that is a decision that the, uh, you know, the Dutch government uh, and the Dutch people can make. You know, well, Donald Trump is not the, uh, you know, he's not the nicest man and he doesn't deal with us in the most diplomatic way uh, so you know what? We're not going to spend on NATO. That's okay. Not a great friend. Not a great friend. <laughs> the, uh, you know, like I said, uh, I, I understand the Dutch have long attained. And if, uh, you know, we look, we look back at the policy, you know, President, this is not a new policy, okay? Uh, 2000 and, uh, 2014. Uh, was when this agreement was made. It was made when we had a President Obama. Uh, President Obama pushed for this. Uh, Donald Trump has pushed for this. The, uh, you know, and, and the other thing, and I, I know we're talking about some of the differences between. Yeah. Um, but we are great friends. Okay. One, of, one, of the, one of the major crises today that we face is, is Venezuela. Okay? And, and who's doing it together? the Americans and the Dutch are doing it together. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to touch upon NATO because you mentioned that Europe or the Netherlands in particular is not committed to NATO. But I want no, to understand No, no, I that said I asked the question. You asked the question. I didn't say okay. they you were asked not. The I just asked the question. Okay, so, so let me ask the question whether America may not be committed to NATO because the 2% is important and, and we can agree that all European countries should uh, raise the level of military expenditure, but na th th the 2% is just a guideline, right? The Actually, NATO it's not a guideline. It was a commitment that the Dutch signed on to. Well, okay. But NATO is more than just cash. NATO is also about respect, dignity, mutual decision making. Why not also focus on that part of the commitment? Great. That's fine. So we respect the Dutch. We respect the, the, we respect the French and the Germans as being part of NATO. Now pay your 2%. Okay. So let's talk about another issue that there's a big uh, I Actually, I'll be diplomatic. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Would you please pay your 2%? Okay. Okay. But we're we're going to have the Minister of, of Defense in a couple of weeks. We'll yes. ask her that question. Uh, yeah. But tell, tell her the American ambassador said please. Please. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Because I, I would hate to be, I would hate to have her believe that I was insulting her. Okay, so. uh, let's talk about a particular, another issue of big disagreement between the Netherlands and, and Russia. Uh, sorry, and, and America, but that involves, 
that it does involve uh, that does involve Russia, which is Nord Stream two, the right. pipeline uh, from North Russia that goes into Germany, and there's some Dutch companies working on it. And, and right. you've said that there's there's going to be potential sanctions against Dutch companies working on on the project. How come? I, I have said that there is the that the president has the authority under U.S. law to impose sanctions on, com on companies that are doing business with Russia. But why? Because we think that it is a geopolitical issue and what we are doing is, or what, what Europe is doing, is they are helping to f two things. They are undercutting a key ally, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. okay? we, we think that Russia wants to damage Ukraine, and by building a pipeline around Ukraine, we are facilitating Russia to put more pressure on an ally of, of Europe, which is Ukraine. The second thing is that we believe that Russia, Russian gas, <coughs> being a bigger player in Europe, is just kind of a bad idea. Why, Why do you think it's a bad idea? Because it, it ties you it ties it ties you in to a key resource from a country that has not necessarily pro proven itself to be a, a good friend of Europe right now. When you take a look at what it's done in Ukraine, what it's done in Georgia, what it's done in Crimea, what it's doing in Syria, what it's doing in uh, M H seventeen what it has done with hacking, uh, attempting hacking into the OPCW in The Hague, uh, these are not the actions of, a, of an ally and someone that is necessarily uh, someone that I think you'd want to get tied into closer from an economic standpoint. Okay, well, we can agree with but you that, on that but some the, part. That, but that's okay. I mean, the Dutch and the U.S., we can disagree on that. Mm -hmm. And but we, right now we do. But you will, there's a possibility of putting sanctions. There, the disagreement under comes U at the under, cost under, of, under of US, Dutch companies. I'm, I'm, I'm very careful how I say this because some Dutch have said by me saying that there is under U.S. law, which is a fact, that under U.S. law the possibility exists that the president could exercise sanctions. Some say, well, now you're threatening the Netherlands. No, I'm just stating a fact. Under U.S. law, it's a... It's, it's an option and a tool that the president may or may not exercise. Okay, well, let's say the same. Let's say, why shouldn't the Netherlands also state a fact when they do business with Saudi Arabia that also has humanitarian crisis, has violated human rights, and is also aiding in a geopolitical conflict when you sell them $350 billion in arms deals? And, that, and the why, point is... Why shouldn't we hold them to the same standards? Please. And what? That, that you want, that you are, you are going to exercise, uh, that you want to impose sanctions on U.S. companies that do business with Saudi Arabia? Well, careful with we, because again, I'm not the We're government not in official. Power, yeah. but, no, no, you know, but, that, but, but that's, but that's the implication, yeah. That, yeah. that you might encourage that as a Dutch policy, okay? Yeah. And if, 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 the, if the Dutch government viewed Saudi Arabia as being as disruptive and as hostile uh, in a world environment as what we viewed Russia, and they wanted to impose sanctions, that is, that is, a, that is an option that the, the Dutch government would have to do. Well, I doubt that they would exercise that option because I don't think that they have that view of Saudi Arabia. Well, the comparison we're trying to make is not which country is more hostile, but they're both countries that just haven't really been good worldwide players. So more question is why shouldn't we, if we're making universalizing principles, why shouldn't this be the universal for both countries? You know, the, the interesting thing in politics is you always deal in the world of gray. All right. It would be interesting if we deal if we dealt purely in black and white. Uh, sure, there are problems with countries that the United States does business with that they are not perfect on human rights. They are not perfect on uh, economic freedoms. They're not perfect yep. on democracy and those types of things. Uh, and we 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 have different relations with with those countries. Uh, clearly, we see Russia uh, in a in a category unto itself right now. Uh, for the military actions it's taken uh, in different places against sovereign nation states, sovereign nation states that, that we believe are closer and we want uh, to embrace. So it, it, is, uh, it is Ukraine, Crimea, 
Georgia, uh, the one that is not being talked about, uh, but I think may start rising in importance again because of Russian meddling is Moldova. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's okay if, if the Dutch government, uh, because of its economic, you know, forging closer economic ties uh, with Russia, uh, feels comfortable that it is, you know, by helping the Russians in their actions in these countries, uh, and it's being funded with European uh, money, if that's fine. If these, you're a sovereign country. You can make these decisions. We just try to help enlighten and, and point out where we disagree. We point out why we disagree. Uh, and in areas where we're in agreement, it's like, hallelujah, we're glad we can work together on these issues. Yeah. Right, before we conclude the topic and move to an audience question, I do want to ask, and I would like to ask for a gray answer instead of a black and white one. There are undeniably clearly transatlantic issues that we've just listed. Do you think this transatlantic alliance is in danger? No. Not at all? No. I mean, I, I, again, if you go back to the Machiavelli speech, yeah. Uh, yeah. I said that the way forward, to, the, the way to, for Europe and the United States to take advantage of all of the opportunities out there, whether it's 5G, okay, whether, you know, the rapid nature of technology, how we move forward economically, is that what we need to do, uh, and this was the whole point of the Machiavelli speech, the best way forward is for the transatlantic relationship to be strengthened uh, and that we have more trade and commerce uh, together uh, than what we've ever had before, that we have uh, a stronger national security apparatus than what we have ever had before. Now, at, now more than at any time in our history in the last 70 years, our futures are more closely tied together and we will have a better and brighter future the more we cooperate and the stronger this transatlantic relationship becomes. And those are the policies that we are putting forward. A stronger transatlantic relationship from a national security standpoint means that we are all committed to NATO and we are funding, uh, we are funding NATO. The stronger, the way to strengthen our economic ties is to remove whatever trade barriers we have between uh, the EU and the US. Not to build more, but to pull them down. Uh, and so, so you, that, you, is the, that is the way that we move forward. You really think the Trump administration <laughs> is strengthening the transatlantic relations. I, I believe that if the, the agenda that the Trump administration is putting forward, that it is, if it is implemented, we will have stronger relations rather than weaker relations than, uh, okay. than what we have. But that we, also depends on the opinion of the Europeans. Do you right. think the Europeans it, think that Trump is strengthening that relationship? I don't, you know. If the Europeans believe that a strong NATO furthers European interest, they will embrace the... Tr I mean, I'm, not, I'm actually not hearing many countries say, we disagree with you, Pete, on, on 2%. Okay? Yeah. I, I, I don't get much pushback at all from the Dutch saying, actually, Pete, we're not going... You know, everybody says we want to get to 2%. It's kind of like, okay, just show us how you're going to get there. All right? I think I don't get much pushback from... Uh, the Dutch or the Europeans on we want stronger trade and that at least verbally they're expressing the idea that the way to get there is by lowering tariffs. That is exactly the Trump agenda. So if they don't seem to be disagreeing, why is that the media seems to be portraying this relationship as in danger? You'll have to ask the media. But you don't see, uh, for example, in the Munich conference r recently, we saw European leaders criticizing some of this administration, some of the language the Trump administration uses, the, the national security threat of cars. I think it was Merkel, the one uh, that criticized it. Why, if, why would they be criticizing that? If them? they want to criticize the style, that's fine. You have to get over the style and get into the substance, okay? But national security threat, that's also a substance, right? National security threat is, is a substance, absolutely. Okay. Let's get some European opinions on this. Any questions? Yeah, the gentleman yeah. over there with the uh, red shirt. T-shirt. Arguably, your president has a complicated relationship with the U.S. media. Uh, it's the term fake news, which is a real issue. 
is frequently uttered or typed. Furthermore, he has labeled the media the enemy of the people. On the other side, the media has written about some of the arguable falsehood that your president has uttered. Do you think the relationship between the media and the current registration is healthy? If not, how would this relationship need to change for the better? And what is your personal experience with Dutch and American media, and do they differ? <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, um, the nice thing about this one, this is one that I actually uh, can and probably will take a pass on in terms of talking about the president's relationship with the media. Uh, that is a, uh, it's a different strategy than, uh, than what I've had with the media. Um, it, uh, you know, these are the decisions that the president uh, has made. It doesn't have much to do with my um, work here in the Netherlands. My experience with the, uh, uh, the media in the uh, number one, like I said, I've got a different style. Last night, uh, or you know, I, I have a very fairly open access strategy with the Dutch media. I had it, I had the same thing with American media. Uh, as long as they treat me what I believe is in a fair and honest way. Um, I will continue to engage with them. It doesn't mean that they have to agree with me uh, or they have to agree with the points of view that I am articulating, uh, as long as I report it accurately. I'm more than willing to, uh, uh, to talk with them. Uh, in the U.S. and in the Netherlands, I've had a couple of occasions where uh, I've had what I would consider bad experiences, uh, where I didn't believe that that, was, that, that criteria was met. Uh, and in those cases in the U.S. and here in the Netherlands, I just choose not to engage with them. Okay. okay. Someone else. Uh, yeah, the lady here with the okay. colorful uh, sweater. <laughs> Could you please stand up? Okay. Environmental scientists have reported that a wall on the border would threaten over 100 animals. Uh, and they would be endangered and probably go extinct. And additionally, the El Chapo trials revealed that almost all cartels uh, transferred their guns and drugs through tunnels or at legal checkpoints. So what value would adding a border wall and uh, stop illegal drug activities and criminals at the border? The, um, the wall will provide a certain level of security, enhanced security. Uh, but clearly, whether it's criminal activities, drug cartels, whatever, uh, who may want to enter the U.S. illegally, there are all kinds of mechanisms for them to do that, whether it is tunnels, whether it's to go, to, you know, to go around it to find other places on the border. Sure. Uh, we are putting, you know, what, the, what a president and what an administration and what a Congress has a responsibility to do is to, divide, is to design and implement a comprehensive security package which includes physical borders, uh, it includes borders at airports, uh, you know, one, it includes enforcement uh, of visas and immigration law. Uh, one of the other areas that is going to need increased focus in the United States is, uh, I don't know exactly what the number is, it, it used to be close to half of the people who are in the United States illegally. Uh, are people who came in illegally, came in through uh, ports of trans, uh, transit, so an airport or a, uh, a shipping port, and have overstayed their visa. Uh, there's, you know, the, ball, the wall by itself is not going to solve all of our problems. It is part of a, a comprehensive package uh, to get this done. Sorry, uh, just we do have to move on, sadly. Uh, but we've discussed about foreign policy quite extensively, and well, foreign policy related to Europe, yeah. but you even mentioned Venezuela. And, and we discussed uh, earlier about intervention, and Venezuela is one of the spots in which the word intervention, military intervention, has been used. So I just want to know, is military intervention on the table for a potential way out uh, against the Maduro regime? As the, uh, I believe the Vice President said on Monday or Tuesday when he was in Colombia, he said all options were on the table. So that includes military intervention? All options are on the table. Okay. But, I mean, you've mentioned, uh, you, you wrote uh, a book against, uh, well, detailing the, the mistakes, the foreign intervention mistakes in Libya, and you even discussed it earlier today uh, about Iraq and the, the mess in Syria. Wouldn't this be one of those stupid wars that Donald Trump talks about and that you've talked about? Well, the... The people that have, have, 
are going to be making these decisions. Okay? Hopefully these are people that, and I'm, I expect that they will be. Uh, Mike Pence uh, was there for, for much of this during, during uh, his time in Congress, that they will take a look at what happened in Iraq. They will take a look at what happened in Libya. They will take a look at what happened in Syria. They will take a look at, at other places where the, where the EU or the U.S. has been involved and where we have focused on regime change, where we have focused on military intervention and all of that, and they will go through a process which we call lessons learned. But do you think that's what the American people want? I don't know what the American people want. Well, the Venezuela. elected Donald Trump, who was firmly against all sort of military intervention. Well, he was supposedly against the Iraq war, against Libya yeah. as well. I don't, I, but I don't know what the American okay. people want in this specific case. Okay? I mean, I think that they, they understand uh, to a limited extent uh, what is going on in Venezuela. Uh, and they are and they, they will recognize two things, that they've elected and put people into power with the responsibility for outlining our strategy uh, in Venezuela. And they will then have the opportunity in our system every two or every four years to hold those that they've elected accountable for the decisions that they've made. Let's talk about what Americans want, because you said you don't really know, but maybe you can answer us for Trump. John Bolton, the National Security Advisor, high up there, one of your colleagues, said, it will make a big difference to the United States economically if we could have American oil companies invest in and produce the oil capabilities in Venezuela. And for us, this seems a little bit weird, because what we're seeing is we're being approached with a humanitarian crisis, and the way that the U.S. responds with it is talking about oil. How can we respect that at all? The way you can respect that is name one conflict, and maybe there are, maybe there are some examples, all right? But n take a major conflict in the last hundred years where the United States committed itself militarily, committed equipment, and committed the lives of our young men and women. And at the end, the people that were enriched were the United States of America. So yeah, by track record. But what, what about the, the, why talk about oil at this moment? I mean, people are really suffering in Venezuela. And we have humanitarian aid there. And one of the things that we have learned from our potential conflicts uh, or from the conflicts that we have been engaged in is that you have overthrowing some of these governments is not that difficult. Rebuilding them and get them functioning again is a huge effort. We started off by talking about, you know, World War II. Eleven years later, my parents were still in a position where they believed that this country was still very much in a rebuilding phase. And it's like, wow, eleven years later, uh, this country, you know, was it really still that bad in the Netherlands? They thought it was. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it is one of the things that, that I've learned as you go through this process is you need to have a plan to get step one done. But sometimes the more important plan is to, okay, now that step one is done, what are you going to do to make sure uh, that this country transition, you know, moves through this transition in three, five, or seven years is back on its feet? I and ask one you of the key resources in Venezuela is, is oil. Yep. Yeah. I do want to finish on a personal note. I'm flying to the United States in eight days to take a citizenship test, but to be honest, this interview has left me a bit confused on what it exactly means to be an American. Not sure if it's transactionalism, oil lovers, or anything, but what does it mean to be an American for you? I mean, I think, uh, you know, again, going back to uh, the Machiavelli speech, uh, I think for me being an American is 
to be part of a country that has a vision and a dream. We, we are aspirational. We are not perfect. Uh, we have our flaws. Uh, Heaven knows we have our flaws, but we are aspirational and we are continuing to try to make the American experiment uh, better each and every day. And because of our shared heritage, uh, I am not at all uh, ashamed to say that America, I believe I'm part of an, exception, uh, an exceptional country uh, and serving in the Netherlands means that I get to serve in another exceptional country. And as the Dutch are fond of saying, as long as America is number one, we are fine with being number two. Uh, and so, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, that, it, uh, that is, uh, from my perspective, a, uh, a great place to be. I, I, am, I am proud to be an American, uh, as imperfect as we are, uh, but I'm also proud of the relationship and the heritage that we share with the Netherlands. Uh, and I expect that to continue to grow uh, and be better. And the, the best way to make it better is to continue to hold each other accountable for the values that both of us are striving for. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Before we give uh, the Ambassador a big round of applause, I do want to say something to, the, to our audience today. Next week, we'll have two interviews. We'll have the 6th of March. We'll have an interview on Brexit from the European perspective. And on the 8th of March, in celebration of International Women's Day, we'll have a panel discussion with four business women uh, from here in the Netherlands. So please join those. And uh, yeah, for now, let's give uh, our guest, the Ambassador, a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Good being